Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you may be. I'm Andres Martinez, the Editorial Director of Future Tense at New America, and a professor of practice at the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. Welcome to our virtual event today entitled, How Soft is the Power of Sport? which is a joint production of the New America National Fellows Program and ASU's Convergence Lab. At ASU, this is also part of our university-wide series of conversations and events called Sparky's Cup that are being held in advance of the FIFA Men's World Cup to be held in Qatar this month already. Boy, time flies. Um, and as you can tell, I am ready for the World Cup. Well, maybe you can't see, but I've got my, my Mexico jersey on, so. Um, you know, I'll probably be wearing it for two months straight, but just kidding. Um, let me quickly switch over to Spanish for one second. Para darle la bienvenida a quienes nos están viendo en México o en otras comunidades hispanoparlantes, si desean seguir la conversación en español, hay una liga que pueden, eh, eh, en el inferior de su pantalla, donde va a haber interpretación, traducción simultánea, si lo quieren escuchar en español. Y bienvenidas. So today's hour-long event, um, is going to feature two different conversations, one on the geopolitical significance of sport, broadly speaking. The second conversation will be a little bit more focused on, on Qatar, the complicated issues um, surrounding that World Cup and how we should feel about them. Um, to, <clears throat> I have been so looking forward to hearing from this fabulous group of people on this topic, and I hope you will enjoy uh, this, this event as much as I do. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I should start off by making note of the fact that Leon Krause, our good friend at Univision, had a last minute uh, conflict arise and he sends his regrets. But we're incredibly fortunate that Carlos Bravo Regidor is able to step in on short notice despite his own very busy schedule. Carlos, as many of you will know, is one of Mexico's most prominent political analysts, historians. Uh, we have collaborated a lot with Carlos at the Cronkite School on journalism when, when he was building up the journalism program at, at uh, CIDE. Uh, he is a prolific podcaster, radio personality, TV, in addition to being a columnist at Reforma. And Carlos has done a lot of thinking and writing on this intersection of sport and politics. Indeed, one of our very first Convergence Lab events in Mexico City featured Carlos on this topic. So I'm really grateful, Carlos, that you could join us. And Anne-Marie Slaughter is CEO of New America, as, as I'm sure you will all know. Um, and Anne-Marie gets asked to speak on a wide variety of topics. Um, I'm guessing sport isn't on the very top of that list, given your, your amazing trajectory and expertise on so many other subjects. But I was really eager to have you here today to help us put sport in this geopolitical context. I mean, you've been the director of policy planning at the US State Department a Dean of a School of International Affairs at Princeton, the author of a book entitled The Chessboard in the Web, Strategies of Connection in a Networked World. And in New America, of course, <clears throat> you're advancing work across a number of subjects with an eye towards helping our nation uh, fulfill its promise and its idea of itself. Um, so I, very few people have thought longer and harder about America's role and image in the world and I just want to start off by asking you this admittedly very broad question of where do you fit in sport in when in thinking about um, and, and as an aspect of, of global pop culture in thinking about how America advances its its interests, its image, and connecting to this term which we reference in our title for the event of soft power. I think the term was first coined by Joseph Nye, but um, I've been dying for months to ask you this question of how do you think of sport um, when you think of America's projection in the world? You're on, you're on mute, sorry. I did the same. I have to start by saying that I probably have not thought enough about sport, <laughs> which is one of the reasons I, I was really interested to, uh, to be part of this conversation. Because the minute you do think about it, it's clear that it is an enormous part of our soft power. And just again, to set the stage, hard power, this was Joseph Nye, but it was also Suzanne Nossel, uh, although Joe Nye really coined soft power. Hard power is the power of compulsion. You make mm -hmm. somebody do something. 
Soft power is the power of attraction, where you want to do something that somebody else is doing because it's cool, because you admire them. And from that point of view, Hollywood was the original soft power. And as you watch India rise, you can see Bollywood uh, and Bollywood uh, across uh, the Middle East and other places. So really the first thing people think about is our entertainment industry. They think about Hollywood and, and all the many other ways that we project images of American life into the world. But sports is a close second, except that until quite recently, sports have underlined American exceptionalism, right? We're the only people in the world who play American football, or at least the way we right. do, right? There's Australian football, there's rugby, but that was a, a, an exceptional American thing. We are the only people who played baseball. That's no longer true. Of course, there's Japan and there's Central America, but our sports were part of our narrative that we were always so, somewhat apart. Right. That is changing. Basketball has been huge that way, right? The, the NBA is a huge source of our, our soft power and our players play around the world and many other parts of the world play. But the global sport is, but here again, I'm going to say soccer, right? We are the only country that calls it soccer. England doesn't call it soccer. England right. calls it football. And I've, I've had it explained to me why we call it soccer. And, but there again, so even this sport that is really the global sport, and I should say I'm half Belgian and I spend a lot of time in Italy and I'll declare myself an Azuri fan and a very disappointed one right now. Um, you know, we have not been able to participate the rise of soccer in the United States, particularly women, I do think is a key part, not just of our soft power, but I'd actually, I'd say now our connecting to the world in a different way. And particularly the new America connecting because in this century, very quickly in the next two decades, we will become, we will not have a white majority. We will be the biggest, plurality group will be white, but the next biggest plurality group will be Hispanic. And they right. certainly will be following global soccer and they will be uh, part of it. And then all the other groups that we are um, and many new African-Americans coming from African countries now, uh, people coming from, from the still parts of, of Europe, uh, but but again, mostly Latin America and Africa, parts of Asia, soccer is less, less critical in Asia. That is connecting us to the world. Uh, and we will then be able to participate in a way that I would have said until now, sport was part of our soft power, but it was it was sending a slightly different message. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that you you <clears throat> reference some, some of that history that you reference is amazing. Um, I mean, I can recall, I grew up in Mexico. I came to the States when I was 15 and and, and felt very cut off from the rest of the world when it came to sports. Now that's changed. Um, I'm dating myself. This was like the early <laughs> 80s. And it was always kind of um, amusing to us in Mexico to that the US could have domestic sports leagues and proclaim its winners world champions, you know, in a world <laughs> series. But I also had a pennant of the Steelers in my room growing up because we did watch the NFL a lot. And it said world champions. Yeah. And I, I was a big Steelers fan, but I even I thought that was a little bit off. Um, but at the same time, we were very much drawn to follow American sports because of just the impact of American pop culture. And, and growing up, I mean, I learned all my U.S. geography and I think all my other um, uh, middle school friends in Chihuahua, Mexico, we, we knew of the U.S. Be, the map because we knew that the Steelers played with the Browns and the Bengals <laughs> and like, so we, we learned about all of this. Um, but Carlos, I want to I want to I want to um, ask you for your opening reflections on on this South power of, of sport, um, you know, whether connected to sort of your your idea of the US, but also more more broadly. Sure thing. Uh, well, first of all, let me say something about like the prehistory <laughs> of, of this phenomenon, because you, you know, in the 20th century, we grew used to the fact that uh, these events, so to speak, were, were, were now we, that we associate uh, with sports where like 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 the key platforms but the, the, there is a prehistory of events just like this 
in which countries really promoted or tried to project and create soft power, yeah. which were international exhibitions or expositions, mm -hmm. the most famous of which were Chicago, Paris, London with the Crystal Palace. I mean, this is a very 19th century phenomenon. And, and we, we, we must remember that nations are very young historical creatures. And uh, this was one of the mechanisms or the devices through which na nations sort of presented themselves to the world. There, there, there's a little one over here. Yeah, I think he wants to speak. I'll, I'll let him speak in a second. Uh, but so the thing is this, uh, these exhibitions sort of created an international market for national images where all countries participated one way or another, you know, and it was unavoidable that the national image had to be designed on the one hand, in order to reflect the priorities, mostly of the governments involved, but also the expectations of the publics. And in this case, the publics were not only the people attending the exhibitions, of course, but also the other countries. Right. So th this was not only a matter of soft power, but a matter, let's put it this way, of soft geopolitics involved. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, Anne-Marie was talking about the difference between compulsion and attraction. And I, I think that, that a third concept that's very relevant for this is persuasion. Uh -huh. What these exhibitions wanted to do was to persuade other countries that they were what they wanted to be. And of course, this was an artifice. Of course, everybody dressed up for the party, you know, whether their best dress, their best tie, you know, they had to get a haircut. They had to, you know, give themselves good makeup, you know. And this, but this was sort of a, a, a game of mirrors, so to speak, where everybody was there to watch and be watched. I think that to a certain point, World Cups and Olympic Games still bear the mark yeah. of that origin, even though introducing sport, you know, does does something to it. It's not the same. It, I, I think it's a change. It makes it more massive, of course, a lot more pop, as you were saying. And th there's also, I think, an important difference in terms of the protagonism of, you know, sp sports people of the very players, you know, uh, in the case, I, I think this is interesting. In the case of Olympics take, take place in a city, World Cups take place in a country. And when you, you look at the characteristics, you know, of the sports, in general, World Cups are a very, very elite event. You know, most of the people that play in the World Cup, play in European leagues, for instance. Hmm. There are, you know, teams like, like big yeah. teams, Barcelona, Manchester United, Real Madrid, where the whole team is present at the World Cup playing for different national teams. I think with Olympics, that Olympics are a much more global event in that regard than uh, World Cups. There are no qualifiers, for instance, for Olympics. And all of this, I think, is important in terms of how we create an image of these countries, an image of, um, of this nation. Of, of this nation, sorry. And, and just to, to finish up like, uh, you know, this intervention, I would like to say that my personal experience in that regard is a bit different because most of my sports culture have very little to do with the United States. Uh, number one, because I, I, was, I was eight years old when the second World Cup took place in Mexico in 86. And I remember very vividly the strong bond that I created during that uh, World Cup with Argentina. I knew nothing about Argentina, but its national team and Maradona uh -huh. and, you know, and the game with England and the, and the fact that there had been a war and Argentina had lost the war, but had won the game. And I'm a historian. And of course, I, I, later I learned all the history. But at that point, it was such a an emotional bond or an emotional experience. And to this day, I still feel that sort of special connection with Argentina. Well, uh, I think, oh, sorry. No, 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 go uh, ahead, go ahead. Well, Carlos, no, I mean, you, you raised so many uh, interesting subjects and, and on the World's Fair, um, kind of segueing into World Cups and Olympic games as these massive 
events where countries can tell a story about themselves. It is interesting that the early Olympics, not the classical times, but the early Olympics of the 20th century were appendages to some of those world fairs. And they were seen as sort of like the athletic exhibition within this broader, and they end up being becoming the main event. Um, and <clears throat> your emotional connection to, to Argentina in 86, I think Brazil is another example of a country that probably more than any other country um, branded itself through that incredible style of play and those teams that won the three World Cups and Pele. And there, uh, recently there, Netflix had a really good documentary on Pele that came out that was really portraying how, you know, the military dictatorship in Brazil kind of exploited that national team to tell a story about Brazil. And, and also for Brazilians themselves though, that team kind of re, re, reimagined and redefined, you know, this this country as a as a biracial, multiracial society in a way that that few things other than sport could have could have done. Um, Anne Marie, on on the soft power of sport, you know, we we a lot of academics just in the last year have started throwing around this term of sports washing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and human rights activists, this idea that. You have regimes that want to appropriate sport to uh, refurbish their image, uh, perhaps deflect from other subjects. Um, we have a year that's bookended in with the Winter Olympics Games in Beijing um, and a World Cup in Qatar. You know, the most notorious example of sports washing perhaps was 1936 with with Hitler hosting an Olympics. So this is this isn't a new phenomenon. What new perhaps? What's new perhaps is that the host nation, you know, it's not a one-way broadcast of this is what the story we're telling. And I think what we've seen this year is you have, we're gonna, we're gonna hear more about this later with people like Michael Page from Human Rights Watch, you have um, this networked world that you've written about. In that world, you have activists and people being able to tell different stories. The control of the message isn't what it quite used to be. And, and I wonder who wins out in that, you know, tug of war between the regime that wants to use these massive events to tell a story about themselves and an opportunity. I, like, I don't know if more people are aware of human rights abuses in Qatar and think of that when they think of Qatar than otherwise would if Qatar were hosting a World Cup. You know, it's, it's, a, it's sort of an interesting to speculate about whether there could be, you know, at the end of the day, it might not be worth it, but countries yeah. like Russia and China continue to want to have these events. So I guess they're calculating that it is. So, you know, it's hard to, to know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the second panel exactly to, to hear from experts on, on the human rights dialogues. You know, if I think about the Beijing Olympics, um, you know, partly because of COVID, it was unbelievably tightly controlled. But right. in normal years, you would you would have had much more interaction of, between the folks in the Olympic Village and the people in the country. You would have had much much greater freedom to attend lots and lots of different events. And simply then being exposed not just to the dialogue, but to the way different people are. You know, it's always interesting to me to look at the difference between Chinese Americans and Chinese Chinese. And I'm not 100 percent able to tell, but generally there's, they're just different postures, different, different kind of ways of being uh, that I think um, are, are useful. I'll also note, you remember in the Sochi Olympics that, that um, Putin did not invade Ukraine the first time until that was over. And again, interestingly this year, not until the Beijing Olympics were over. So clearly there is an understanding there that the story they're trying to tell and, and, and major geopolitical events are connected. I, I would like to think that the that you have to open to the world to a certain extent to be able to host one of these things. And that at the very least, it's a two-way flow. Um, I do think though, I'm, 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 Carlos, I'm fascinated. I went to the 1964 World's Fair and it was telling a story about my country to me. I still remember a <laughs> great deal of it. Uh, and, and so I think probably overall, um, the government wins on that balance, but I don't see a world in which we 
would want to try to politicize the World Cup. I mean, it's rare, right? I mean, Russia has been disinvited, but in general, you don't want uh, politics to, to permeate sports beyond the, the really egregious. I just want to say one other thing that sports are the example I always use of how you have rivalry without enmity. And mm -hmm. actually, we need this far more in the United States, right, where if you disagree with somebody politically, they are now other and they are demonized. And yet, I often think sports are how you come together. You know, you support your home team regardless. Uh, and that those are what, what uh, Robert Dahl called cross-cutting cleavages, where you can disagree on a lot of things, but be passionately united on others. Uh, and I'd like to think, just exactly as Carlos said about his connection to Argentina, you know, that, that that's also true uh, to some extent globally. Carlos, we also have the example in the past of, of Mexico mm -hmm. uh, trying to tell a story to the world about itself through uh, by hosting the 19 the back to back 68 Olympics, the 1970 World Cup. Uh, we don't have too much time to get into too much detail about it, but t tell us a little bit about kind of what the story was was then and, and was that an example of of sports washing and obviously there was a lot of activism around around those those events and 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 a quite a tragedy in Tlatelolco. Yeah, I I think it was. I mean, Mexico was undergoing uh, a process of, of modernization, so to speak. And you know, uh, in the history books, this period is known as uh, because particularly because of the economic policies that took place, it's called uh, stabilizing development, right? So Mexico has been very successful in portraying an image of itself after the Mexican Revolution. And it was supposed to be the good revolution, particularly after the Cuban Revolution, right? Where Mexico was a revolution that could have been, that, that was friendly to the United States, for instance, you know, in contrast with the Cuban Revolution, uh, particularly with the communist sort of, of, you know, later stage of the Cuban revolution. But, you know, that image had run its course by the late 1960s. And Mexico, I think, was interested in portraying itself as a nation that deserved a place in the concert of more of developed or at least developing nations. And that was, of course, the narrative that was that, that they tried to project in this couple of events you were mentioning. But, you know, as, as you just said, you know, control of the message has never been what it what, what the organizer what organizers wanted to be in mm -hmm. the case of mexico i remember particularly two things one of course is as you mentioned the student protests that actually gave, gained a lot of traction precisely because of the olympics mm -hmm. because they they were you know in defiance of that image of a prosperous mm -hmm. peaceful mexico students were protesting and that might actually have some weight in explaining why the repression was so harsh but on the on the other hand, there was also you know the image of Tommy Smith and Jim and John Carlos, yeah, you know, with the Black Panther salute in the podium in '68, which was also you know that was so off script, <laughs> but it's something that a lot of people remember. Maybe that's you know one of the key images of those Olympics, and that was not of not, Olympic not, history. Period. Yes, yeah, and it was not Power part of that. the plan at all. That's also something beautiful about this, you know? There's always this tension between the image that wants to be portrayed and the image that people end up getting, you know, that they, they, they don't necessarily co coincide. Uh, one more thing about that, I think, is, you know, how in many ways, you know, the internationalization of national football leagues has also, you know, created a new phenomenon of a certain cosmopolitanism, you know, in, in, in team loyalty, you know. Mm -hmm. Barcelona has fans all over the world, yeah. probably more than in Barcelona. Yeah. You know, <laughs> how many Catalans play for Barcelona? How many Spaniards play for Barcelona, right? I mean, I, I think this is also something, it's a very European phenomenon. You know, I, I was trying to, to, to compare, I didn't have time to actually put the comparison together, so I'll just suggest it here. If you look at soccer teams in Europe, particularly the big ones, against NFL teams, for instance, how many foreigners play there? And how, you know, how does that composition affect the terms of identifications that fans have towards these teams? You know, I, I think something along those lines yeah. also translate to, translates to soccer, 
Yeah, I went to know, a game in uh, Wolverhampton a, in uh-huh. the north of England, and and the, that whole community feels very close to Mexico, and and have learned a lot about Mexican exactly. culture exactly. because the one strike because their star player for a number of seasons was Mexican striker Raúl Jiménez, and it's an amazing bond. That's a soft power That's diplomacy soft power. with one player in in a most improbable setting. Time is flying by, and and I do want to segue to the second conversation. This has been a great opening, but just to 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 finish off this conversation, you know, we're about to look more at the particulars of Qatar, but Anne Marie and Carlos, looking beyond Qatar, the next Men's World Cup, of course, in 2026, is in North America. It's going to be shared by Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. The three North American countries, and that's kind of an interesting opportunity for what what kind of storytelling are we going to tell about our region by hosting that World Cup? I don't know if, if you all have any sort of closing uh, thoughts on that or um, suggestions. I and mean, we have four years to figure out what the story is, but um, Emery, if you were- I love that. Department. I didn't realize that, but that is such a powerful statement to say North America. When does North America do anything? And when, does all, when do all three countries in North America, because so many uh, Americans, people from the United States, when they think North America, they think the United States and Canada. Uh, and of course, <laughs> in this context, Mexico will definitely have the leg up, <laughs> which is an excellent thing. So I do, I think that's a real statement. I mean, Carlos said uh, the World Cup is countries where the Olympics are really cities. And the idea that this is three countries you know, imagine if it were the EU, although it really couldn't be because it's too big. Well, no, it's the same size. So imagine if the whole mm-hmm. EU did. So I think that's a that's a signal statement about cross cultural connection uh, in in through sport and through thinking about power a different way. And it'll be our two hundred and fiftieth anniversary yes. Um, yes. in the US, which I know, since independence, which I know you're you're working on. Carlos, any any marketing advice for the uh, 26th World Cup? <laughs> well, you know, I I might bring a bit of a more pessimistic note because I remember that when when that World Cup was planned originally, you know, the prospects for the North American experiment were a lot brighter mm. than they are today. But you know, maybe this is this is a message of resilience that in spite of these, you know, new waves of uh, nationalistic authoritarianism or populism or whatever you want to call it, you know, the integration of these countries, the regionalism that, that is taking place will survive. And, and sports is a great platform for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, that's kind of optimistic in terms of the, the sports <laughs> influence there. Um, Anne-Marie, Carlos, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, uh, really appreciate your participation, uh, and I could talk to to both of you for hours about this, uh, but we do want to segue into our, our second panel, um, and so let me introduce, uh, and first of all, this I was going to hand off the moderating baton for the second panel to Scott Brooks, my ASU colleague who directs our Global Sport Institute, but he also had an unavoidable conflict present itself, so you're stuck with me for another half hour, uh, but I'm excited to welcome for this conversation Lisa Clavinus, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. We didn't have a chance to talk before. Okay. Um, she is a former star football player, a lawyer, and the president of the Norwegian Football Federation. And Michael Page, who is the deputy director for the MENA division at Human Rights Watch, the <coughs> Middle Eastern North Africa division at Human Rights Watch, and our own New America Fellows program alum, uh, my good friend uh, Frank Four, who's a staff writer at The Atlantic, and of course, authored the bestseller, he's the, he's the author of the bestselling book, How Soccer Explains the World, An <laughs> Unlikely Theory of Globalization, uh, which was written quite, <clears throat> I, I feel like just a few years ago, but maybe it's now like a couple of decades ago, and yet um, you were ahead of your time in terms of, of thinking about explaining the world through sport. Um, so th- thanks to all of you for joining. Um, and let me start off with you, Lisa. Um, you gave a remarkable address at the FIFA Congress in, in Qatar earlier this year. Um, and you said, where well, you said among other things that, let me read over here. In 2010, the World Cup was awarded by FIFA in unacceptable ways with unacceptable consequences. Human rights, equality, democracy, the core interests of football were not in the starting 11 until many years later. 
Um, <clears throat> I, I found that very powerful. My, my question now is um, how should players and federations react to being told to go play in a nation that doesn't uphold some basic rights? I mean, how, how do you advise people to approach that? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me here. I'm actually at UEFA's headquarters today. So, so I'm at the little sister of, of FIFA. I had a graduation this day for, for a master from international player, actually. So I prioritize to still come to you guys thank before you. going to the dinner. Thank uh, you. We know no. it's late there. So thank you so much. No, no, it's not that late. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's a difficult question to answer short on, you know. It's, it's been 10 years, 12 years of... Uh, of uh, agony in this case for many of us uh, and uh, and uh, I, I don't remember it was Anna Maria or, or who said it but the core the core value of football is to bridge people and it, it, it is to have the ball running in my view uh, regardless to have it is to have United States to play against Iran or to have Russia to play against whoever so, so, so to have you know steep fronts and to have boycotts in football, you know, it, it's not not where we should end. But still, you know, this this award in 2010 really shocked everyone, and it's not just one parameter that shocked because you end up you know in one corner of discussion all the time. What about Russia then? Or what about Argentina? What about? But you know, this 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 whole cake, you know, this whole cocktail, it ended up you know have no legitimacy, uh, and then. And then the risk uh, for breaking human rights was, you know, very foreseeable, uh, more foreseeable than any historic award before this. And it also ended up bre uh, breaking uh, human rights for very many years. Then you've had very many important law reforms in Qatar, which should be apl applauded, even though they're not really implemented on all aspects. It should be applauded, but that does not... Uh, justify the wrongdoing when the award happened because we're not human rights organizations and we can ne never justify awards by making law reforms five years later. It's, it, it's, it's not FIFA's, UEFA's or the Federation's core business to do so. And I think it's dangerous when, when football organizations or other organizations for that matter pretend that the core business to justify something else is is to sort of change the world because we 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 do football you know and football touches upon politics of course it does because it's a lot of money uh, it's a it's a lot of uh, stakes it's a lot of joy it gathers the world like nothing else uh, and of course it's politics but it should come from football but this award made made us through us everyone every one of us out out on you know fields of of politics and 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 it's 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 very difficult so your question was, I guess, how should federation react? I don't have the answer to that. I, I, my federation and my members um, uh, have, have decided to, 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 to do, take all necessary measures to, to use this platform, not to be activist or populist, or, uh, but to be as credible and insightful as we can so that this never happens again. Uh, and that we uh, use the responsibility we have as members of FIFA now to try to really implement the changes uh, that should happen, not because that's our core business and not that I would justify anything, but now we're in it and now we have to stick together, try to do that. I feel like a lot of players, uh, managers, federations are um, grappling with, with the right tone or actions to take going to Qatar. Uh, Many of you might have seen there was a very um, poignant video from from the Australian teams from the Socceroos talking about they have the right to organize as professional footballers and and they wanted to empathize with um, the workers in in, in Qatar um, and and also with the LGBT community. It was very poignant, I, and the Danish team going to Qatar has also. Um, I think spoken out and taken some action, but Lisa, are you disappointed that um, you that there hasn't been more, or do you find like these expressions are are heartening? And and should, in your mind, a a, a full boycott have been more of a of a 
action that should have been contemplated. I feel like that was in the conversation, but never really something that seemed a path that many countries or even a few countries were really willing to consider. Look, I would say it's 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 uh, it's uh, it's a matter of the time the timing you're asking. You know, after the award, it was not a legitimate award. It was very obvious for everyone, even though we, we did not find the smoking gun. That that's just because it's it's trans uh, countries. It's beyond borders, so you don't have the same you know momentum to go into into the all the details. I think it's very obvious that this was not you know a clean award. Uh, and and then then I don't want to talk about boycott. Then then it should be you know redressed. It should be done over again. Uh, and more countries should have demanded that back then, so that it could have been moved, and so that Qatar could have the opportunity to build uh, infrastructure. You know, uh, low to make the risk lower to have events because this is the biggest event in the world. So to start have no really you know impact in the football world and then to start with the biggest event in the world with a kafala system which is basically you know a modern slave system with no domestic workforce uh, and also and also no women football or no real plan to how to mm. make it safe for lgbtq people which are a part of the world and the fan base where the risk was so so high so so i think in the first years we should all go into ourselves. I'm also a leader of a federation, so it, it goes to myself as well. We should have walked away from the table and, and made it, you know, made the award again. Now we're here. And now I think it's irresponsible to talk about boycott now. Now it's built. Uh, the changes has been made. Um, some of the changes has been made also because of pressure from World Cup. And now I think we have to walk the talk. And I, it, it's also a responsibility for us football leaders to protect the game it should go. The game should go. Uh, that's our job. You know, we if we don't believe in the power of football to unite people, it's not a cliche. And I hate when people, you know, and I understand that it's some sometimes uh, made parody of it because it's so much. It's been so much problem with uh, corruption and 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 criminality in sport. It's still the biggest sport in the world. It's still the most accessible sport in the world. So it should go. We in Norway, we had a boycott debate, very upheated. So it's been different in the world. Uh, in 2021, we had an extraordinary Congress where we had a vote if we should boycott or not. And we've never in the history had such an extraordinary Congress before. And, and the members voted no. That was when we were in the run for the World Cup. Unfortunately, we did not qualify uh, after that. So, so in Norway, that was a very interesting thing to, to be a part of from a a democratic point of view but most members decided not to boycott but that we should work on very concrete measures to to have an um uh, strengthening of human rights in norway in europe and fifa and in qatar not that norway can do all these things but that we should be agents of change for this right um frank i want to turn to you and and i should have mentioned I, i i know that we don't have you until the the end of the hour, and, and you've been patiently listening to a lot of this, and, and you are um, a connector of dots extraordinaire, and if you were writing your book today, um, how would you discuss sort of where we are um, in terms of understanding globalization with this increasing, it feels like, mix of politics, sport, human rights, you know, take us wherever you'd like in terms of reacting to understanding the situation. I think that the sports watching, watching that's happening here in Qatar is connected to things that are happening in global sports writ large, which is that you have a handful of small Middle Eastern potentates that have infinite amounts of money that they can invest in sports. And so part of it is indeed about soft power, but a lot of it is just about people with a ton of money uh, pleasing themselves. It's self-gratification. Qatar is going on a gigantic ego trip here. It's connected to commercial interest for sure. Qatar is like, uh, you know, these countries uh, uh, specialize in shipping and they, they have airlines that they like to, 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 to hawk as part of this. But I think that um, this is maybe one of the most grotesque spectacles in the history of global sports. And mm-hmm. because it, it's not just that um, you have an authoritarian regime using an event to buff its image. 
you have an event that was built on blood that um, the labor that went into constructing these stadiums resulted in deaths of a non-trivial number of laborers who were treated in the most abysmal sort of way. And my fear with this World Cup is that we're gonna walk into it and because the spectacle of the sports is so addictive and so pleasurable to global audiences, even with the, these stark facts sitting in front of us, we're mm -hmm. going to neglect them and we're just going to turn to the game. And we are gonna repeat a lot of these cliches about how the game is good for humanity, but it was, it was definitely not good for all the laborers who died in impossible conditions. Um, and so, you know, we're all gonna wrestle with the morality of this because as fans, it's gonna be impossible for us not to engage. I know this for myself. Like I, I'm not boycotting the games, I'm watching the games. Um, and yet I know that makes me complicit with something very, very terrible. I'm so glad you, you raised this because I, I think it's, 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 it's a really uncomfortable truth. I mean, it's one thing to talk about what all this means for nations, right? But in a, in a time when we as consumers try to be more conscious about the sourcing of what we buy and our food and everything, this is the sourcing of our entertainment. And like you, there's just no way I am not going to watch a World Cup. You know, these, this is the high point of, I can, I can, like World Cups ever since I was, you know, um, eight have punctuate, have been the punctuation marks of my life. I can remember exactly what, there's such a joy. And John Oliver, who's been a, a frequent critic of FIFA, I, I heard him in an interview say, he's watching, even though he knows all of this stuff and, I, and he's not sure what that says about him. But is there anything that we should do differently as we, you know, tune in and just, stop thinking about what we've been thinking about and talking about, as Lisa points out, since the thing was awarded in 2010 and treat this like just another World Cup. Well, I think that FIFA is an organization that's susceptible to public pressure. I mean, I wrote an article after the Women's World Cup where I think I argued that we should just cancel the Cutter World Cup and like redouble the resources into the women's game where we have all of these extraordinary inequities in the way in which resources are developed, but I think just as um, as fans and people who are participating, it's kind of incumbent upon us to repeat, both, both to learn the truth about what happened in the run up to this World Cup, and so that we that that complicity is kind of always um, front and center. And I think it's important for us to keep having this conversation about um, the, the 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 human rights travesties that were committed that will continue to be committed committed I you know I'm very interested to see how players behave because this is maybe one of the old sorry puppy this is maybe one of the ultimate examples where you have a young workforce that's very politically committed that you know especially in the English league where taking a knee has been one of the rituals of of the game and you have a lot of players on the English team uh you know who've said that they're very uncomfortable with mm -hmm. what they're going to be forced to contend with. And then they have federations who are kind of the older bosses who are content with kind of all of the moral, uh, the moral compromises that are required in order to participate in global sports. And so I'm very, very fascinated to see how players respond and whether uh, players kind of become the box populi and say the things. And, and remember, Qatar is a place where certain sorts of dissent are not permitted. And so um, the fact, you know, if you have players go into that type of context and start to loudly shout things, who knows where that goes within the Middle East or within, within this country itself. It provides an example that could be um, unmistakable. So that's something that I'm watching for. It's interesting that, uh, you know, you talk about the, whether it's, it's a, exercise in, in ego and because they have unlimited resources, but also perhaps for branding purposes, all of this investment coming into sport. Um, one thing that's, that's changing is it's not just, oh, I'm going to host a World Cup or an Olympic Games. It's now seeping into the sport that we enjoy year round, right? Like they're acquiring the European clubs and the Saudis now want to have their own golf league, you know, live. And, and that, that's, that's, that's kind of a, a new one. And, and you and I watch, I think, a lot of English Premier League. Um, and I'm, I'm an Arsenal fan. I, I believe you are too. We can feel kind of smug that our team doesn't happen to be one of the ones owned by, you know, um, the Saudis recently acquired Newcastle or in the, 
up until the invasion of Ukraine, you know, the, the Russian oligarch owned team. But yet, you know, again, thinking about the sourcing, like we have this deal with uh, Visit Rwanda sponsorship, which raised, has raised a lot of questions of human rights. I mean, um, again, how do we, do we just sort of like know it and look beyond it because- Well, I think part of what is, um, I mean, we know this from other sports, but what happens when you have these petro states come into um, club ownership is they start to break the game itself where it becomes impossible for any other team to compete. And so when you have Saudi Arabia and you have Abu Dhabi and Qatar owning clubs and having the sovereign wealth funds essentially behind clubs and not necessarily expecting return and investment because it is about ego gratification or it is about soft power, it fundamentally makes sports unfair. And so I think that sports, global sports is going to have to reckon with this fact. And I, you know, at some point, there probably should be a regulation that simply prohibits nations from buying soccer clubs because it, it ruins the surprise. We know Man City is going to win every year because of Abu Dhabi. Right. PSG is going to win every year. We know Newcastle is going to be uh, you know top four team because of Saudi Arabia. And it's just not, it just defeats the whole. Although it, legally, I think that, that regulation is already in place, right? There's this, there's a wink about whether the, the sovereign wealth fund is the state and whether it should. Yeah. But that's right. a, in, in their financial fair play rules that supposedly right. constrain what they can spend. But <laughs> yeah, well, Frank, I, I need, I know you, you have, you have a, my a, daughter a, is playing in a uh, semi-final game uh, for her uh school soccer team and so i need to it's, need it's all for the need to go we need to go yeah yeah yes. yeah, yeah, yeah great yeah. talking to you okay um, thank you yeah michael uh you are our human rights uh expert we've been talking uh about your subject and you must be sitting there thinking like put me in coach um and to be fair to cut to cutter um or qatar i know there's multiple pronunciations uh the qataris have said that um uh, there's a bit of a double standard going on here. Um, Carlos in our earlier conversation referenced his um, being a big fan of the Argentine national team in 86. The first World Cup I can remember watching was the ninth, like really closely, it was 1978. And I was, a, I was a kid, but even then I was struck by those scenes of like the, all the military in the stadiums and the snarling dogs. And I mean, I didn't know there was a dirty war happening like literally as the World Cup was unfolding, but um, you know, countries like Norway and Sweden and Denmark and, and the Netherlands have not been the only countries that have hosted sporting events in the past. And so how do you address this, this question of double standards um, that the Qataris raise? And also like the progress that's been made that, that Lisa alluded to, um, but just kind of like put this in a context for us of how we're supposed to understand, you know, where, do you, where, where should we think the line ought to be drawn in terms of who is um, qualified to host international sport? Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just start by saying, you know, Lisa has been a, a real powerful and, you know, brave voice within a FIFA system where it feels kind of all too lonely in terms of kind of, you know, reflecting this type of, of, uh, of critique. I mean, uh, Andres, I just kind of wanted to reference an earlier point and, and build on it. You referenced sports washing, right? That this is a, that this is a, a tactic or it's been discussed as something that, that is supposed to distract from the human rights abuses or, or build a positive reputation. I think in Kata's case, and the reason there's been so much focus is that the sports washing is the abuse, right? We knew, FIFA knew in 2010 and before that there was this massive infrastructure deficit that had to be built, number one, and that there were not labor protections in place for the migrant laborers who were going to build it to do so. And so this, this desire on Qatar's part to host the World Cup without any kind of preparations has in itself fueled these kind of central abuses. And I think that this focus is very hard to kind of distract from because in other sports washing contexts, you know, often, you know, uh, sometimes the abuse isn't like directly connected. And I think here, like the reason there's such a visceral reaction from fans, footballers, et cetera, and particularly in this industry in which there's such a disincentive to speak out yet, yet group individuals and groups like Socceroos, like other former footballers are doing so is because it's directly tainting them. Right, even though they had no part in it, 
the stadiums that were built were constructed in which there were thousands of unexplained deaths of migrant workers, many of whom likely uh, died or were injured due to these outrageous and unfathomable conditions of heat which forced the World Cup to be moved, right? I mean, you know, I grew up loving to watch the World Cup, but that was a summer event, right? At least in North America, that was something we watched in the summer. The reason it had to be moved was it was simply not safe for fans right. and, and the footballers and the most fittest people on earth to actually host, right? So that, that type of thinking and consideration was never given to migrant workers in the first place. So we have these thousands of unexplained deaths. We have these you know, this very widespread wage abuse and wage theft, right? Which, what does that, like, what does that mean? It sounds very abstract, but there are many, many people who came to Qatar to essentially have a better life for the family, pay for their daughter's education. They often came, they paid these illegal recruitment fees. They essentially paid to get a job in Qatar from origin countries like Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Kenya, Philippines. So they pay, they're often under debt when they go. And then their employer, because they're part of this, this kafala system or sponsorship system that gives such disproportionate power to employers, maybe they just don't get paid for three months, four months, five months. And that just puts an incredible burden, an amount of pressure uh, you know, on migrant workers that you know, has obviously had all these huge ripple effects. And so we can kind of see the reality now is that while it's positive, there have been reforms from a perspective of a human rights organization that is also commented on China's hosting of past mega events, that's commented on Saudi Arabia's purchase or the public investment funds purchase of the of uh, Newcastle United of Russia. From us, there's a consistent like there's a consistent attempt to try to really critique abuses, and this is just a huge set of abuses. It's so large and complicated, it's actually kind of hard to unwind the spectrum, right? Because I'm talking about migrant rights and what we can do about it, but there's this whole set that's like an afterthought that usually that should be front and center too about what about LGBT people, yeah. right? And not just fans, right? But LGBT residents that face these laws where if you have same-sex relations, you could face up to seven years in prison. And Human Rights Watch has documented documented abuses and mistreatment that LGBT people in Qatar have faced. So all to say is, I hear- hey, Michael, I think that, on, yes. on that, can I just ask quickly, Please. ask, um, it, it seems like the, the Qatari government has been at least, uh, has tried to be responsive to some of the criticism on the labor issues with some of these reforms. And I understand there's a big debate as to whether, you know, these reforms are just on paper or in practice. Have there, have they been responsive at all? And this is a question I, for both you and on, on the LGBT yeah. issues at all? I think central, I think we can frame all of the reforms as they, there are some promising initiatives. It's not to say this is all just kind of like a public relations aspect. There are but that's just on labor, right? On, on labor. LGBT issues and the discrimination on, and the- On LGBT, I, fundamentally, I think there's too much. So if I could just kind of split up on labor, yeah, there are promising reforms, but I think we can really categorize it as too, too little, kind of too late, right? And they don't address all the previous abuses that happened you know, previous to the reforms when they were awarded the World Cup in 2010. On LGBT rights, I think the central is, is that I think they're, they want to have it both ways. They want to say, look, fans are welcome, right? They've repeatedly said at the highest levels, including the emir, the ruler of Qatar, saying we welcome everyone, but there's always a conditionality, respect our culture, right? And, and that kind of tension point there is, well, under Qatari law, right, culture, everyone should respect, but, we, you know, we should also be, you know, committed to human rights protections that, you know, apply to everyone, regardless of where they are. And the reality is, is that LGBT people have faced abuses in Qatar. And that's the reality that that FIFA has kind of brought us to. And so we're, we're grappling with that. So I would say there's a message that can sometimes be positive from them, but mm -hmm. we can't look away from the reality. The reality is there are abuses that have been documented very recently, and that's a risk. Okay. Lisa, is there something you want to add to that? Yeah, it's a lot to add to everything. I would, of course, uh, you know, Michael knows knows what he's talking about, so I will, I will just uh, support. I, I I think it's 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 hard to communicate in this case. You know, we have different positions. You know, I'm, I'm a president of a federation, and then I want to communicate very 
accurate and 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 not you know like amnesty can can uh, you know go very high and have a very high headlines and strong headlines and I, I support that they should you know it's their roles, uh, but but as members of FIFA these are you know these are this is my own organization you know it's, it's uh, colleagues uh, and. And and it's very hard to communicate that these reforms are really good. You know, it, it's 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 really good that they're happening. To abandonment of kafala system, minimum wa- wa- wage law, uh, uh, compulsory heat uh, breaks during the day, etc., etc., etc. Some of these are implemented. The minimum wage, I think, is the most implemented one. I think most workers will now say that they they if they get their payment, like you say, Michael, it's, it's wage theft as well, but if they get their pay, it's it's on the minimum wage level. So that is a good good one. But with the heat break, I don't think it's, it's that implemented. Uh, but that does not justify, you know, the years and years of, of right. treating people as animals, you know, and, 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 and uh, uh, we have to be very stubborn to have this debate on a human rights level. It's not about criticizing Arab culture or racism or not having Qatar to play football. And to me, it, it, and, and, I, and I, it's part of the cost, of course, to, to raise your voice that you will be accused of this. And I, it makes me really sad if people in Qatar believes that this is the Western world's response to, to them going into football because they are welcome, of course they are. Everyone should be welcome into the sport. And, and who are we to throw rocks, you know, in, in a glass cage? But these are in the international human rights uh, and, and to have people carry the bricks to our stadiums and, and die for it, it's, we, we have to now, even though those changes are very good, uh, we now have to partly make sure that they are implemented thoroughly we partly has to have to have compensation funds to have historical abuses uh, being compensated for the lives lost, but also for our own legitimacy for this to save to save our sport. And it's it's hard to not go to become a bit virtuous, you know, and be a, because it is really important things at stake. I think, uh, and it's urgent. So so I think with the LGBTQ uh, case, it's also. It's also uh, very difficult. I think this is the area where the Qatari uh, and the whole Middle East, they, they don't know what foot to stand on, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and I, I sympathize with it in, in some ways, you know, as, as a colleague of the Supreme Com- or the Football Association trying to organize an World Cup. But I'm married to a woman myself. And it's, 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 it's very hard to accept that we now, in very few years, have moved the momentum in, in such a place where I cannot now speak of it because then I put people in Qatar at risk. You know, in my own World Cup, you know, this is the sport I live. Uh, and and so, so, so then we have to speak about it. So we move the political momentum backwards again. Uh, and, and, it, and it's not acceptable to say that this is religion or you, I know it is, but this is also football. And we decided some core values which, that, that needs to be in place there. It's non-negotiable. And of course, I know when you say non-negotiable, you will be applauded by your supporters. And in football, we we always, always have to negotiate, you know, because the ball has to run. But it should be a very clear statement from the football organization that we do not do these awards until the risk has been taken down. So I think it's dangerous, I think, to go to those conclusions that what does doesn't really work anyway, and you know, uh, we're here now and not, it will never be fixed. No, I think now, now I'm talking about us in the football leader positions and also you in the media uh, that no, you cannot, you have to do your part. You, you cannot, uh, that does not work. You know, you have to do your part. You know, what leverage do you have and, and what is the most constructive way to use it and use it. And you also have to make sure to elect leaders that work ethically. If this is a democracy and people are re-elected all the time and discussions always end up with, why does not that player say this or that? Where, where, where are people when elections happen or one year before the election happened? Because that's when the real elections uh, are happening. We're, we're up on the hour um, that was the event was scheduled. We have a, a lot of questions from the audience. I wonder if, if Michael, Lisa, if you have a couple of minutes to take some questions, I, but if you need to go, that, that's, that's fine. 
I, don't tell people it's a taxi bringing okay, just, me just, uh, until well, they. I'll, I'll ask you one, and then and then I can I can shift to Michael. Um, Michael, if you if you if you have time too. Um, but Lisa uh, Philippe from I believe New York City. Kind of, I mean, I'm going to paraphrase this this question, but he's talking about the uh, you know where is this going to end? Are we going to see a a World Cup in, in North Korea? You know who's going to speak out here and. And I want to ask you whether you feel that um, the international community, uh, FIFA, has has kind of learned through this process, and whether you're optimistic um, going forward. I mean, in that quote that I read, you said that um, human rights hadn't been in the starting eleven until many years later. And again, this comes back to the theme that I think you put on the table: that while we're about to experience this World Cup in Qatar in 2022, the vote, the decision. The initial outrage, if we want to call it that, was in 2010. It's already it's it's been quite a while. And in that intervening period, while the World Cup wasn't derailed, it's happening. Um, there has been a lot of discussion. Do you feel like there will be uh, more thought put into these decisions in the future, or might we see a repetition? I know Saudi Arabia is applying, you know, bidding for yeah. a World Cup in the future. No, I I I think that's why we have people in posts you know not now we have to uh, try, try to try to influence in the in democracy so that it does not happen in the same way but i think the most important le uh, legacy of well, not legacy in a positive way but but still the consequence uh, because i don't think anything can justify what has happened but the, mo the most important consequence of, of of the award is that pifa really had a big big reform uh, where they change the award criteria, it could be even sharper, I think. Uh, but it's still, you know, from from going from twenty two guys in a dark room, you no know, metaphorically, but but still, uh, like like the jury system, you know, you go into a room, you don't even have to, you know, reason your verdict, and and, and you have crazy verdicts then, and, and and this happened, and now now it's it's you have to have a due diligence within the country, human rights due diligence, if you want to apply. That due diligence should be objectively assessed again. It should go through FIFA Council, uh, and then it should be voted in 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 uh, the FIFA Congress. And I, as a president, everyone will see what I voted on. And if then it's awarded to a country with high risk on all, you know, LGBTQ migrant workers, then the democracy the democracy is in real trouble. You know, then then we're there. But we that hasn't happened yet, and I I don't think. Part of me is very pessimistic, and I think it's really dark or, uh, clouds in the horizon due to what you said, Michael, of, or, or who said it about the, the, the big, big, big money. You know, it, it's, it's not even much money for someone. Uh, and then they, the capitalism will, will win. But part of me thinks that, no, with this pressure, with media, not just one part, but media, supporters, um, leaders, players, if if we want to change and still try to be commercial, but but want to change, and we now keep the pressure up, uh, then 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 the, this might work. So so I think it's it's very important to to keep the pressure up. People will say, and they say it to me all the time, "This is double standard. What about this? What about that?" And and I and I, and I understand. We almost understand that, especially the people now uh, taking the heat, maybe doing their best. To change very conservative systems in Qatar, they should of course be applauded. We should all applaud them. It's difficult, it's great, but it's a bigger picture here and, and we, try, we have to try to communicate both because the pressure, the external pressure has up till now been the only thing that uh, results in change. Yes. Lisa, th thank you so much uh, for joining us. <laughs> yeah, they are um, sort of. <laughs> yeah, so really appreciate Sorry. it. Um, Thank you for having me, and great and, to and listen to we, you guys. Really, also, yeah, we really admire your your voice in these on these issues, as Michael um, mentioned. So, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, bye. Bye, bye, Michael. If I could, if I could turn to you quickly, we have um, John Pis, Piscioda, Piscioda, and uh, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, ask an interesting question about the legal restrictions imposed in Qatar on on the coverage of of the. Cup and whether that's going to make it easier for for the host country, the regime, to to control the narrative, despite uh, you know what we're seeing now on on social media. 
how do you how do you think about that? I mean, that's that's an, another level of concerns we haven't even addressed is just like the freedom of of the press and speech at the event itself and surrounding it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good it's a good question. I mean, maybe I can frame it in a in a trying to take on one of the Qatari authorities kind of responses, right? At its core, some of what Qatari authorities have said is is look, this is double standards or even has a racist intent, you know, into it. Often European, North American with many of their own problems and abuses, including of of, of migrant labor abuses. I think to kind of tie it together is, and even, you know, uh, foreign international, you know, human rights organizations. Let me say it like this. I am, I'm speaking only because, you know, we are representative of a rights organization, but none of this is new. Migrant workers themselves have said that. However, they've paid a very heavy price in Qatar, right? I mean, that's the kind of core freedom of speech issue. Putting aside journalists, the people who are most affected as kind of a victims of this system. And it's why, as Lise said, we've been pushing for at least some type of more positive legacy in the form of a compensation fund to address all these past abuses, but they've spoken out at great cost, right? There is no kind of like you know, question from them. They are speaking out out of bravery and desperation and people have been, including individuals, like there's a Kenyan migrant worker named uh, Malcolm Bedali. Malcolm Bedali uh, was uh, enforcedly disappeared and then deported from the country for speaking about, about kind of core migrant rights issues. So with journalists, yes, as we understand that there are these kind of uh, further restrictions, you know, in terms of what can be, like stick to the sports, right? Don't, don't, don't talk about the politics. And there's been a past, even recent history about journalists, for instance, trying to cover uh, labor camps, trying to cover areas where, where migrant, migrant workers, you know, operate. I mean, I just really hope they don't stick, stick to the sports. I mean, it's absolutely essential. There's no way to artificially divide this question of like other issues. Sport is totally enraptured. I mean, I, I read Franklin's book many years ago and wouldn't want to be quizzed on it, but there's like the takeaway of globalization is like absolutely, you know, fundamental to, to kind of how, how we see this. They really do need to be covering these issues, you know, and, and usually for sports journalists that are visiting temporarily, hopefully there is a higher bar to really kind of like see seek this out because I think there are a lot of stories about, about migrant workers, even if, and I kind of want to put up as a human rights organization, these are things that do bring risks for migrant workers themselves, right? It's why, you know, many, many people, when you see their stories being told, they're often the families of, of migrant workers who, who have died abroad because there isn't a second chance for those migrant workers to go back. They've been uncompensated. So I, I want to say, yes, that, that, that risk and challenge exists for journalists, but I want to put the focus back on migrant workers themselves who the whole time that they've been in Qatar, they have faced that, that huge yeah. disincentive and risk. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's well said. And on, on your point about, um, you know, and a number of, of, of us have touched on this, this issue of the sort of moral relativism and the kind of whataboutism that, that often arises and, and we're getting the pushback from the Qataris themselves. I should say that as a, as a Mexican and as a Mexico fan, one of the things that, that I've been deeply ashamed of in recent years, um, and particularly in the 2014 World Cup, it's kind of when it really started, was a sort of homophobic chant that is very popular among some Mexican fans. Um, when uh, the opposing team's goalkeeper does a kick. And FIFA has actually um, criticized and, and brought pressure. And there's actually been sanctions at this uh, expression um, against the Mexican Federation. And a lot of Mexican fans have this reflexive, how, how dare they criticize us when they're taking a World Cup to a country that, so there's always this tendency and, and, a, and of course sports fandom can get very tribal of always being able to point to another outrage that's not being remedied or or that's being tolerated or that can be worse. And it's just this very dark game of, um, you know, pointing to something else when, you know, two wheels don't make a right. And the fact that uh, you can do something about one problem shouldn't, you, sh you need to address that even if they're, you're not gonna solve every problem in the world. <laughs> but just to close here, I mean, kind of coming back to like the, core question, Frank and I were talking about how should we feel about watching this or what can we do? You've mentioned a compensation fund. So, you know, Human Rights Watch um, has brought attention to a lot of these issues. This World Cup is still happening. Because of the attention, there have been some reforms. 
but what what do you what's your best case scenario um, for what comes out of this? And is there are there concrete actions that federations players going to Qatar um, should be demanding, asking for in light of this platform and, and the moment we're in? Like, how can we help ameliorate all of the issues that you know you, you've brought to the world's attention? Absolutely. I mean, I think a theme of this conversation is that there have been a very small number of kind of elite decision makers, largely unaccountable, making decisions, for instance, of where World Cups are hosted, et cetera. And the, the, the goal of civil society organizations, human rights groups working with my is, is try to make that more accountable, right? Like FIFA has a human rights policy that they adopted, I believe in 2017, that tries to mitigate these what we call adverse impacts. You know, kind of of the sport. So, like, what can we do now? And Qatar, I want to say it's not hopeless, but I want to recognize if you're an individual fan, it's challenge, right? Like, you are a consumer, right? And so you have a very small amount of consumer power. What we've been encouraging is let's work up this kind of a hierarchy of kind of the FIFA football industry, right? In which fans operate in a collective, right? They are fan groups, etc. Call on your football association to publicly demand that there be a remedy fund, that their team and associations speak out about LGBT rights issues, to kind of push that forward and make yourself aware, right? I mean, I think even the first, the baseline step is make ourselves aware of these issues. Even I has been working on different issues, like the kind of extent of rights abuses in Qatar, you know, that have existed for these past dozen years is, is quite like, you know, it's uh, it, it gives you pause, right? And that's why it's kind of a push. So I think we can't, we have some impact and influence on the institutions closest to us. So our football associations, fan groups, you know, media, et cetera. And then I think, uh, you know, for the future, I think fans demanding, look, fans have power in a collective as well as football associations and footballers as part of this industry. They can demand and push that, let's say for sake of argument, whoever is chosen as the next World Cup after 2026, that the human rights standards that are on paper in FIFA are actually respected. I mean, I am, I'm absolutely so concerned about if a state like Saudi Arabia, you know, gets the, gets the World Cup, that's deeply concerning. So we should be speaking out now and making our voice heard, right? And, and uh, you know, I, I, hope, I hope, you know, Qatar and FIFA kind of hear this kind of collective collective uh, uh, response because no one wants to be tarnished. It may, I, love, I love soccer, but like, it makes me super uncomfortable to be able to like watch it with everything that I know. So I'm hoping that they commit to publicly to a compensation fund. I think that would relieve some of my guilt, you know, yeah. ahead of the World Cup. So let's see. Right. <clears throat> well, we'll be, we'll be following that issue. And thank you so much for, for providing some of this context. Um, and, and for sticking around, this this event's been sort of a, a relay race of a, of a conversation with the baton being handed off. Um, really want to thank everybody who tuned in, who's who's still with us, and the New America Events team, um, and all of our great speakers. Um, and uh, we're in for an interesting experience of this extraordinary World Cup not occurring in the summer um, and occurring under some very uh, troubling circumstances. And yet, uh, the whole world will be will be tuning in. And I think. Michael, you've given us some some thoughts in terms of, of how to do it. Um, and <clears throat> as consumers try to have some collective action for some remedial action. So it's been it's been great hearing from you and, and thanks to everybody. So nos vemos a la próxima. Bye bye.